Satan Baby, a spooky yarn for Yuletide, told by Sir Desmond Sterling. Chapter One Charles, Viscount de Bourbon a Bisqui, gentleman, adventurer, patriot, and Englishman, despite his Gallic title, stood back to admire his handiwork. On with the lights, he instructed his man Staunchpole, once his loyal and brutal sergeant in the trenches, now his equally loyal and no less brutal factotum. Staunchpole flicked a switch, and the Christmas tree lit up very gaily reminding Charles of a tart he'd once known, or was it twice, in Bruges. Well done, staunch pole, said Charles. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. This year, Charles had decided to celebrate Christmas at his family home, the 17th century Hazel Court, just outside the little Hampshire village of Hinchcliffe's Comover. He usually fled to sunnier climes, but what with Europe rumbling with beastliness, thanks to the wretched Hun, he suspected this could be the last peacetime yuletide for some years. So he had decided to open up his large country seat to his closest friends. His young nephew, Simon Tubular Wells, will be here, along with, Charles sniffed with disapproval, his latest girlfriend, Lady Selina Topographic Ocean. She was a good, prospective wife for Simon, sound family, wealthy, good breeding stock. But Simon was too young to be thinking of marriage. He still had oats to sow, and, with a war imminent, foreigners to kill before he needed to settle down with a wife and start spawning. In a fit of seasonal benevolence, Charles had even invited his ex-wife Marjorie to join them. She'd recently been jilted at the altar by her latest beau, a colonial cove in oil, wealthy, with all the accompanying vulgarity, who'd suddenly seen the light and scarpered. Charles couldn't blame him, but he'd also suffered a twinge of sympathy for the old harridan, particularly as she was Simon's aunt. Besides, she usually behaved herself in front of her nephew, and was less likely to wrap her legs around the nearest male. However, apart from Simon, the only males present would be Charles himself, Staunchpole, who had had his manhood partially shot off by the Bosch and Wipers, and the Reverend Inman Grayson, once he'd torn himself away from the home for wayward boys of which he was a patron. Charles took another satisfied look at the Christmas tree, which filled the atrium of Hazel Court. All he needed to do now was place the Christmas presents under the tree, get Staunchpole to pour him a large whisky, and while awaiting the influx of house guests, hop in a bath and start to enjoy the Yuletide season. Charles glanced at himself admiringly in the mirror marvelled at his fine looks for a man of his age, straightened his bow tie, and set off downstairs for pre-dinner aperitifs. His guests had arrived earlier, safe and sound. Simon and Lady Selina had driven down in his nephew's brand new and rather nippy Austin Mitchell. Marjorie had phoned from the station, demanding to be fetched, unlike her to travel by so common a transporter's train, so her purse must be uncommonly tight. Staunchpole had mulled some wine, not just for his guests, but in preparation for any passing mummers or carol singers. Christmas Eve was the only time Charles allowed the villagers to approach the front door without having the dog set on them, so the locals relished the chance to walk up the main drive and pier, saucer ride into the hallway, and see a lifestyle they could never hope to achieve themselves. If anything, the Christmas tree looked prettier than ever, Charles stared at it, entranced by the twinkling lights, as childhood memories of being in this very spot arose from the depths of his mind. Eight-year-old Charles, eager to unwrap the enticing parcels lurking around the base. Would there be toy soldiers? A puppy? 
a gun, perhaps his first manservant. He was shaken from his reverie by Staunchpole's voice. What is it, Staunchpole? Staunchpole bowed. There's an old gypsy woman outside, sir, with a donkey. She's asking for water and shelter. Charles sighed. The poor was such a nuisance, particularly at Christmas. But he didn't want a donkey dying on his land over the holiday, nor an irate gypsy. Let her use that ramshackle barn up on old Nick's moob, Staunchpole. But make sure she stays away from the house. As Staunchpole walked to the front door to give the instructions, Charles caught a glimpse of the old Romany. She was a shriveled, walnut-faced thing, swathed in shawls, stoop-backed, and seemingly dwarfed by the skeletal donkey she held by a string. But as she glanced up, Charles shuddered. Her eyes blazed at him, radiating the sort of contempt for her betters that frankly deserved a horse-whipping. But there was also something eerily familiar about her. Charles dragged his eyes away, took a slug of mulled wine, and, determined not to let an old crone spoil the evening, strode into the drawing-room to join his guests. Simon stood by the hearth, the flickering fire reflecting in his dazzling blue eyes, his still boyish skin tanned from a recent visit to South Africa, where he played cricket with the natives and sold armaments to the government. His broad shoulders, slender waist and firm buttocks suited evening wear. And, as always, Charles felt a stirring of pride deep down inside whenever he saw his nephew. Marjorie lay on the sofa like a slut, her shoes discarded, her hair not what it should be, an inch of ash teetering at the end of her cigarette. She had eschewed the proffered mulled wine for a tumbler of brandy. As always, Charles marvelled at the thought that he'd once been capable of intimacy with her. Of Lady Selina there was no sign, but young ladies did seem to spend an awful lot of their time at their toilet these days. Yuletide felicitations, Uncle Charles, yelled Simon, who then greeted his uncle with a hug, which took Charles aback, but didn't altogether displease him, although he would have had flogged any other man who had tried it. Where's the delightful Lady Selina? asked Charles. Marjorie muttered something which Charles didn't catch. Probably the first time someone didn't catch something off Marjorie, he thought to himself. Oh, she is taking her time exclaimed Simon. Ladies, eh? I'll shivvy her along. And he bounded out of the door like a puppy who was unaware of an impending trip to the vet. Charles dutifully bent down and kissed Marjorie, who proffered her over-rouged cheek. Glad you could make it, Marjorie, Charles lied. To his horror, Marjorie replied by starting to sob. Oh, Charles! Why do you men treat me so abominably? I loved him, I really did, and not just for his money, although there was a frightful lot of it. He was so handsome, and for the first time I thought I'd met a man who really made me feel like a woman. Charles ignored the implied insult to himself and told Marjorie to pull herself together. Inexplicably, she cried even more. Fortunately, before Charles had to try and comfort her further, Simon rushed back into the room. Lady Selina, he huffed. Sh sh she's gone. Charles took charge. Gone? What do you mean? Perhaps she is powdering her nose. But she never does that, explained Simon. Her bedroom window is open and there are signs of a struggle. From outside in the garden, a scream rent the air. <coughs> Lady Selina, gasped Simon. To be continued. Sir Desmond Stirling's Satan Baby was written and performed by Anthony Keach.